Um, all right, so we're back in the saddle, chapters three and four. Um, we finally get to meet our Tralfamidorians. Um, let's get started. Oh, I forgot to look, by the way. To, <laughs> I know I said I would. I forgot to look for uh, other connections between shock therapy and time travel, aside from that, that crazy movie. <laughs> I will do so. Okay, I just have to remember to do it. So they're captured uh, by four Germans and a dog. Uh, let's mention the dog first. The dog was shivering, her tail between her legs. She'd been borrowed that morning from a farmer. She had never been to war before, really like most dogs. <laughs> she had no idea what game was being played. Her name was Princess. So what do you make of this? I mean, I think it's pretty pungently. What? Anyone, Anyone want to say something about that? Um, it's it's mm -hmm. it's ironic so her name is princess uh, mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's why he chose that that's the name. yeah her name's princess it's not just that i mean she's uh she's him <laughs> i mean in a way she's not prepared for this uh he had been not borrowed from a farmer per se but just you know <laughs> had a little bit of optometry school and sent on his way to fight in a war. He's shivering. His tail is kind of between his legs. I mean, if he had one. Um, had no idea what game was being played. We kind of see that more and more as we learn about Billy is that uh, <clears throat> he doesn't really have the, the big picture of the war in his head. It's not, it's not on the, <laughs> it's not in the stage of his mind. You know, it's not in the background, the war in, in, a, in the way it is for, you know, somebody in the high command of a war, obviously. And you could even say that about Roland Weary in a way. He doesn't really understand the situation he's in until he gets captured. <laughs> he's living in this kind of, uh, yes, Nicola? Uh -huh. Did you raise your hand? You're, you're muted. Oops, sorry, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to add something, but didn't mean to interrupt. So please uh, finish and I'll... Oh, I, uh, I was just saying that Roland also, yeah, as much as he you know, relishes in his fantasy, <laughs> fantasy life about the war that he's in, uh, Roland is also not really aware. I mean, it is in his head, it's a fantasy. He's not living in the war either. He's living with the three musketeers and all of this toys that he's brought with him. Um, and when he gets captured, he kind of realizes that the actual situation. Uh, go ahead, Nicola. Yeah, uh, what I wanted to say is something I I personally felt uh, wanted, wanted to emphasize in some of these passages, and especially a bit later when uh, Viri uh, found himself unprepared. And mm -hmm. that that was uh, kind of pointing it out for me because I I felt that uh, what also can be uh, let's say inferred somehow from the text is that um, men are never not men people uh, you you cannot uh, you cannot ever be truly prepared for war right something along those lines yeah can you, can you really be prepared for war I mean. Not really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like any catastrophe. That was a part of yeah. the plague too. You're, you can never be prepared exactly. for the plague. You can yeah. never be prepared and for a hurricane. You can never be prepared for, for lots of things like that. Words will fail you. Your imagination will fail you. Exactly. <clears throat> and, you know, ironically, uh, Billy, you know, hardly saw any fighting and it's too much for him. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as the Germans, also just local irregular soldiers, as they say. So these are not regular army soldiers. These are just some locals who grabbed a couple of guns. Um, they're clothed fragmentarily with junk. Oh, yeah, it's two old men and two boys and a commander. Um, hang on a sec. Who was the, uh, the commander? We have him back here. Yeah, a middle-aged corporal. Uh, who was red-eyed, scrawny, tough as dried beef, sick of war, been wounded four times and patched up and sent back to war. This is an interesting sentence. He was a very good soldier. 
about to quit, about to find somebody to surrender to. <laughs> uh, so the best. Um, it's, it's interesting to put it that way. He was tired of this. He didn't want to do it anymore. His bandy legs were thrust into the golden cavalry boots, which he had taken from a dead Hungarian colonel on the Russian front. So it goes. Um, so, yeah, he's uh, in charge, but doesn't really want to be there. Uh, they dig through Roland's precious things. Oh, yeah, first we get that Billy sees Adam and Eve's and Eve in the corporal's boots. The corporal's boots are so well shined that Billy sees Adam and Eve in them. And he also looks at the 15 year old boy and sees Eve. So it's a very, let's say, not very masculine boy. Uh, he sees him like an angel. And the angel is wearing clogs, like wooden, likely wooden shoes with a hinge in them. Uh, and uh, that's about to change for him, though, <laughs> as Roland is stripped of his precious things. Oh, you hear the two scouts in the distance being caught and shot. So it's a good thing that they didn't go with the scouts. Another irony that the two experts at surviving in the forest go off on their own and immediately get caught and, and killed. Uh, while the two least experienced people are off on their own, surviving. Um, <clears throat> so yes, they make Weary sit down, take off his boots. Those are given to the boy. And Weary gets the clogs. Um, oh, we lost someone. Um, you guys know what clogs are, right? <laughs> it's like wooden shoes. Yeah. Weary and Billy were both without decent military footwear now. So Weary is now just like Billy. They're on the same level. This must be terrible for him. They had to walk for miles and miles with Weary's clogs clacking and Billy bobbing up and down, up and down, crashing into Weary from time to time. Billy is still polite as ever. I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, I love that about some of these descriptions where he's, you know, he's always just an unassuming, apologetic character. They get to the <laughs> prison depot and He's like, look at this wonderful place. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't say that, but it, the way it's described, he's not enjoying, but he's taken in by the sights. That's sort of exciting for him. Um, he slips through time again, finds himself asleep in the middle of an opto uh, optometric exam. Uh, this is interesting. I, there are places throughout the book where you can pick up evidence that maybe this is all in his head. It's the times that he experiences World War II are actually flashbacks. The fact that he has fallen asleep here is something we might take into consideration. <clears throat> uh, so he's fallen asleep while examining a patient who's in a chair on the other side of the owl. Uh, you guys get what he's talking about, this owl, the optometric lens set that hangs down in front of your eyes and they switch the lenses and, say, and they say, is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Um, it had happened to him before. It had been funny at first. Now Billy was starting to get worried about it and about his mind in general. He tried to remember how old he was. He couldn't try to remember what year it was. He couldn't remember that either. Okay. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, back in, or in Luxembourg, I think, uh, back in the past, they decide they want to use him for a propaganda photograph. And I love that he's described as his faith wreathed in goofy goodwill. <laughs> so you can picture in, <laughs> in your head him emerging from the bushes with a smile on his face, a goofy smile with his hands up, um, which is kind of adorable in a way um yeah they they're like okay come out of the bush <laughs> um they threw him into the shrubbery he comes out they menace him with their machine pistols as as though they're capturing him who knows he may have ended up on the cover of a newspaper um okay then he flashes forward again 
Um, so here's where we start to get some pretty, I would say, important contrasts. Um, he uh, ends up in 1967. There's a lot of historical content here at work as well. I don't know if you guys knew offhand about 1967 and 1968 in the US, how those years went. <laughs> um, okay, let's first look at what it says here. Um, he finds himself uh, in his Cadillac in 1967. So Cadillac is of course, at least it was a real symbol of wealth. Uh, back then. It, I mean, it, it still is to some extent, but other cars, I think, have overtaken that. Um, it's considered a very luxury, big car. It's such a an American, uh, like, oversized car. Uh, Germany dropped away. 1967 became bright and clear. Free from interference of the past. Okay, Billy was on his way to a Lions Club lunch, luncheon meeting. Uh, Lions Club, I think that, I have to remember, it's like a veterans club, I think, something like that. I have to double check. I should have checked before this. Um, we have all of these uh, <laughs> organizations that are clubs for, uh, I think it's all veterans, but I'm not sure. There is like the Moose Lodge and the Elks Lodge and the Lions Club. My friend Robbie, his dad was in the Elks Lodge and he was a Mason, which is not as cool as it used to be apparently because he was just a big, <laughs> a big like, I don't know, <laughs> not what you'd expect. <laughs> um, he had lots of cool books though. Uh, so yeah, he's going to the Lions Club lunch meeting. It was hot, but Billy's car is air conditioned. So he's comfortable inside of his cozy car. He stopped at the signal in the middle of Ilium's Black Ghetto. The people who lived there hated it so much that they had burned down a lot of it a month before. It was all they had and they'd wrecked it. The neighborhood uh, reminded Billy of some of the towns he had seen in the war. The curbs and sidewalks were crushed in many places, showing where the National Guard tanks and half-tracks had been. Okay. So um, 1967 in the US saw the, uh, oh, I guess, first of all, yeah, we'll talk about this first. What's significant about this? There's a historical little tangent I'm gonna go on after this though. Um, well, I think I kind of already alluded to it. Um, anybody wanna say something? Yeah, Giovanna? Yeah, well, it was a time of the uh, Vietnam War and also civil rights movement. So African Americans, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the March on the Washington, I think it was in 1968. And he's yeah. mentioning National Guard. So I think there was some sort of um, civil unrest suppression. Right yes. Um, so Aside from the fact that we see this contrast between his, so there's the, that uh, material uh, comfort and, and wealth uh, that he kind of rides through on autopilot because that's how he rides through his life at this point because he's realized that he's just kind of, as they say later on, an insect trapped in amber, not really able to change anything. Um, it also mentions that a black man knocked on his window and he did the simplest thing, which was to keep driving. Um, so he ignores everything, but the slight historical tangent I wanted to talk about was the long hot summer of 67. So there were a huge number of riots in 1967. Some of this might sound familiar. <laughs> 159 race riots. Um, this is just from Wikipedia, but. Uh, so in June, there were riots in Atlanta, Boston. This is obviously not from the book, <laughs> if you guys are not sure, if you didn't do the reading. Um, this is an aside. Uh, Atlanta, Boston, Cincinnati, Buffalo, and Tampa. I couldn't find one in Ilium. <laughs> um, so I think he just threw that in there. I mean, it's the summer. He just talks about how hot it was. Um, 
it's 1967. Uh, there were really destructive ones uh, in New Jersey, Michigan. They were described as battles. Um, there were things like snipers on rooftops. I mean, it was really big and huge portions of neighborhoods were burned down. Um, <clears throat> but the way that he puts it is that they burned it down. They burned the neighborhood down. They hated this place so much that they burned it down. Um, as a result, Lyndon Johnson established an investigative committee um, and came to the conclusion that, I don't know if I put the conclusions in here, uh, he came to a much different conclusion than those you might hear nowadays. Uh, he said that uh, inequality, unemployment, and other issues were the cause. Uh, of course, he was, oh, okay, yeah, I did include some more. <laughs> uh, yeah, unemployment, abusive policing, poor housing, already present in certain areas of the U.S. Uh, riots began to flare up. Um, rioting happened across the country. The summer of love was occurring in hippie communities and Americans witnessed troop movements in Vietnam war. Uh, and, uh, in American riots on the nightly news. Yeah. They were seeing troops deployed in American cities. Um, this has not been historically a good thing to happen. Um, I think it's the same year as the Kent State shootings. I don't know if you guys know about that. Those were National Guardsmen shooting college students at Kent State University uh, in Ohio. Um, aha, someone has returned. Um, okay, so yeah, they released a report uh, blaming pervasive social inequalities for the riots. 83 dead, thousands injured, tens of millions of dollars in property damage. Um, so he's clearly making reference to that. I mean, he talks about there being tank tread marks on the ground and crushed, you know, corners of the streets. Um, it's a picture from some of the rioting, whole neighborhood burning. Um, so yeah, he drove then to a scene of Hi. even, hello, yep. go ahead. Oh, Hey, uh, what's up? Good evening. How do you do? Nicely, nicely. You, uh, here I am reading and listening. Uh, I don't know about riots in 67, uh, yeah, checking, yeah. Uh, checking my microphone. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how do you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm, I'm fine. With okay. That. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm glad mm -hmm. to see you again uh, this you week. You too. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, those years uh, at the end of 60s are my favorite uh, period uh, in, uh, I don't know, music, let's say. And sure. so uh, a couple of movies, of course, uh, with that theme uh, shooting uh, about shooting college students and so uh, also uh, a couple of uh, a few photographs uh, over the uh, social networks like uh, students uh, putting flowers in the uh, yeah, barrels yeah rifles, rifles of uh, national uh, guards yeah and uh, that was a pretty amazing uh, picture uh, with those flowers in the uh, in those uh, rifles, you know. Yeah. So that was a hippie period, a period after all. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, on top of it, uh, uh, I don't know, finally there, were, there was uh, Woodstock, uh, I don't know, like mm -hmm. music festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Music festival, and uh, that's my favorite uh, because uh, a lot of uh, music genres uh, were gathered in in one place. I don't know about half a million, a million people also gathered uh, uh, at the yeah. festival, including in hippies Woodstock. and Hell's Angels. Hell's <laughs> Angels uh, were, were present. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, they were. They were running security for Woodstock. They were running. I, uh, security. Uh, uh, I don't know. Security. I'm, uh, I'm very familiar with that. Uh, um, As am I. <laughs> uh, Rolling Stones uh, uh, music uh, 
video clip uh, I know uh, when they were uh, touring around the, the states, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, sympathy sympathy for the devil. It is uh, the thing, and I I saw the there over present hell angels, and I yeah. I watched yeah. that. Uh, video clip, I don't know, maybe hundreds or two hundreds time. And every time I watch it, it is interesting to me. Very interesting. I watch uh, those guys, uh, Angels, mm -hmm. as uh, study, I'm studying their characters. I don't know. Mick Jagger also, because uh, uh, that uh, terrible event, I don't know what uh, the name of the place was. And uh, uh, the situation happened that uh, uh, some of the some men, I think it's a black man or African American, uh, tried uh, pulled out uh, his gun to, uh, and tried to shoot uh, uh, G uh, Mick Jagger. Yes, mm -hmm. tried to shoot Jagger. That was uh, official. And uh, one, uh, one of the boys, uh, Hell's Angels, saw that and uh, I don't know, uh, stabbed him with a uh, knife and killed mm -hmm. him to death. Killed him to death. And it was it was a very interesting, uh, interesting, very interesting uh, uh, video to watch and to observe, to uh, study, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there were a lot of uh, frenzy, a lot of uh, I don't know uh, feelings about those young, uh, those young people there that had uh, uh, someone uh, were crying, some ladies uh, so some ladies uh, crying, and. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, people still enjoyed and uh, uh, singing uh, along with uh, Mick Jagger because uh, they were, uh, in a way, uh, trying uh, to calm down the audience and uh, they didn't uh, uh, stop playing. Yeah, and that's dedication. That's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know, also, uh, uh, one frame is very interesting uh, to me when uh, one of the boys, uh, similar uh, like Hell's Angels, but uh, it is not their, uh, I don't know, top member maybe. But he was present in audience and uh, he had uh, uh, hair, I don't know, maybe bigger than mine and beard. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in his uh, Texas uh, jeans, in jeans jacket. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he, he was just doing like this. More like uh, there is uh, in uh, his uh, uh, body, like a uh, great uh, uh, amount sure, he was of energy, in and he was trying to to uh, to release the energy out, but he couldn't because Jagger was around <laughs> and watching. <laughs> it was very funny, very funny. He just did like this. <laughs> very funny. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was so absolutely it's... amazing, uh, uh, very uh, frenetic. Uh, friends, it was uh, hysteria, hysteria. So. Yeah, it was a a lot was happening during those years, and uh, uh, I, that's part I, of the reason that this book was so uh, was so popular when it was released. Uh, it was just the right audience, yeah, just the yeah. right time. Yeah, right time. Um, that's my favorite period in, in music. I don't know all those festivity, and it, it was in in a way. Uh, I don't know, according to some uh, kind of uh, uh, those um, uh, theory, I don't know, no, I can't remember now. Uh, like, uh, it was in a way uh, like experiment that CIA was uh, inducing. Uh, oh, don't get like me started watching, there. What will they, uh, they, uh, I think. Uh, That's for you, another if, time. If, if, <laughs> That's, you're talking about MK is, Ultra. If, it, it, it is uh, true in a way because uh, I uh, I don't know scientists probably have to watch the people under drugs using drugs yeah, and yeah. how will they behave in uh, uh, gathered uh, in a great number I don't know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I I really don't want to talk about that right mm -hmm. now, but uh, it's definitely a topic you can find a lot of people talking about. Um, I did favorite, recently favorite. read. Uh, and also, uh, the uh, music I was talking about, uh, "Sympathy for the Devil," is yeah. a great uh, uh, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a great song. I, I, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, um, it has good. a great rhythm. Yes, yes it, it, it has African rhythm, uh, African rhythms, a lot of, and Africans sure. also playing. Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. Okay, okay. So let's kind of get back to the story a little bit. 
Um, okay. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no Sorry. problem. <laughs> um, so Billy uh, drives through a, a scene of even greater desolation. So this is a place that's being improved. They've knocked everything down. It looks like Dresden, pretty much. The house where Billy had grown up used to be somewhere there uh, in this empty space. This was Urban Renewal, a new Ilium government center and a pavilion of the arts and Peace Lagoon and high rise apartment buildings were going up here soon. So this is an area of town that had been completely leveled. Um, and his home where he was born was gone and that was all right with him. It's a, uh, I, I can't help but notice a kind of connection to another Camus character <laughs> um, from The Stranger. <laughs> He's kind of like just whatever, you know, going through life. <laughs> but he's kind of on rails. Do you guys know what I mean by that? On rails, like a train? Uh, especially since he's unstuck in time. Uh, the question arises and will arise again later. Can he be meaningfully said to have any kind of control over anything if he's outside of time? It's, uh, I don't know if it's a question we can properly answer. Um, but yeah, he's totally cool with the, the destruction of his neighborhood. Billy had a framed prayer on his office wall. It's the serenity prayer. I'm sure you guys have heard it before. Um, his method for keeping going, uh, even though he was unenthusiastic about living. A lot of patients saw the prayer and told him it helped them get, keep going too. It went like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, wisdom always to tell the difference. And this is, of course, ironic because, well, he can't change any of those. <laughs> he can't change the past, the present, or the future even. <clears throat> um, you know, the first one we all generally accept as something we can't change. But his inability to change things extends into the future. This is what I was getting at with the, with the rail, life on a rail. I just thought of something. <clears throat> that'll come up later when the hobo comes up because hobos live on the rails. I didn't think about that before. Huh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, okay. Uh, there's something else I noticed that I didn't notice before when I've read the book. I've read the book a couple times um, over the years and it's great to find something new. Uh, I don't know how I didn't notice this before. <clears throat> he speaks at the Lions Club about his son to a Marine major. Billy's son, of course, is in the Green Berets. Those are like special forces um, <clears throat> for the Marines or the Army. I can't remember which. I think the Marines, yeah. He told Billy the Green Berets are doing a great job. He should be proud of his son. I am. I certainly am, said Billy Pilgrim. Does anybody notice this connecting back to something? Think back to the beginning of the book. There's a scene in the biographical portion, the chapter one, where he talks about being kind of drunk at a party and talking to someone about the fact that he was at Dresden during the firebombing. And the guy immediately starts talking about the horrors committed by the German army or by the German government. Uh, and he's like, he can't think of anything to say back. And he's just like, I know, I know. <laughs> it's like this. It's kind of uh, a situation where, of course, when the person, because he says, you know, I was there, I saw the unbelievable uh, carnage wrought by the firebombs. Uh, it was it just unspeakable. I couldn't believe it. And the person is just like, well, do you know what they did to people in the concentration camps? And all, he can't really say anything back to that. All he can say is, I know, I know. <laughs> and that's it. That's all you can really say. There's nothing you can really say back to that, you know. And I got the same kind of feeling here where he certainly doesn't feel particularly uh, great about his son being in Vietnam as a Green Beret. All he can really say is I am, I, I am, which is of course not really true. He's not that proud. Well, I mean, he doesn't have much of a feeling about anything. 
Um, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, uh, sorry. Uh, ladies first, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that uh, if he, I, I don't think he would ever say that he wasn't proud because then he will be perceived as um, um, patriotic. Oh, right? yeah. Which is a, a huge thing not yeah. to be in America. I mean, in Serbia also, but in America. Well. Sure. No, I, I look, I'm quite familiar with this problem. I have family in the military and uh, <laughs> it's always kind of like, you got to be really careful how to say things and and everybody has some relatives, I assume, who are super patriotic and uh, only can hear things in a certain way. Uh, go uh, ahead. I'm, sorry, uh, I'm patriotic. Uh, I like to be. <laughs> I like being patriotic, but in a normal uh, way. I don't know. Sure, Not I think a... that there's. I think there's that, that there can be a healthy love for one's you know, countrymen. Yeah, of course, uh, that is, uh, 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 in my opinion, it is the essence of uh, the normal grow growing up of, uh, uh, I don't know, teaching uh, uh, little ones uh, about teaching children uh, to love, I don't know, to love, uh, to love uh, the community they are belong, uh, belonging to, to love sure. their sure. Uh, ancestors, I don't know, to love the history of the country. Right, but it is about patriotism, and it is about the, the future of, of the country. I don't know. In general. Sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm certain. Uh, every country has its history and uh, the future, of course. Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't like uh, those uh, the, that thing uh, like globalization. I don't know. It seems to me like a unilateral, like uniform, you know, and uh, every person like being robotic and uh, doing. Uh, 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 very uh, little uh, about the meditation, about the thinking, doing little thinking, just, just acting, acting in a way like robots do. But I mean, is, uh, uh, less, you could make uh, arguments on both sides of that, <laughs> of that divide. Okay. Uh, I, I certainly don't know a lot of extremely patri Okay, let's say um, patriotic to the point of. Okay, let me just put it this way: it is quite commonly the case that uh, people use patriotic uh, sentiments to precisely not think. I mean, <laughs> and, and be robotic as well. Uh, in fact, I find that much more often the case. Uh, I don't really know anyone who's like, ah, uh, okay, not in any enthusiastic way, like I'm a globalist and I think we should eliminate all cultures. That's just like a, a cartoon that's invented by nationalists to be afraid of. Um, that, that person doesn't really exist, but I have definitely met real people who are over the top patriotic to the point that they excuse their extremely bad behavior and refuse to examine their own actions. That person exists many times. Yeah, uh, some, I don't know, some people are like uh, born soldiers, I don't know, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, th those uh, uh, adrenaline, I don't know, uh, those uh, warrior genes, uh, like uh, in modern, modern way, uh, fashion, and uh, tell, and told yeah, I suppose. Uh, that they have uh, 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 plenty of adre adrenaline and uh, those uh, warrior genes, I don't know. Yeah, and, but I mean, uh, I'm not specifically uh, talking... People, uh, the, their place are definitely in the army, and uh, uh, the, all uh, that uh, I don't know, government or uh, some um, uh, people uh, uh, like uh, th uh, their superiors, all they have to do is to educate them, not uh, to. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the military doesn't, uh, in the military, there's no such thing as education. Uh, you need uh, to act like soldier and uh, to be yeah. prepared yeah. for. That educating, oh. but training. Okay, let's get back to the story. Uh, uh, just a minute, uh, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, to uh, tell also about those people being in concentration camps uh, when they are... Uh, uh, finally, uh, when they got uh, freedom, when, when they got free of it, uh, mm -hmm. they couldn't speak uh, at all. They couldn't say uh, nothing, uh, just a word. 
uh, they were silent, absolutely silent. They couldn't speak nothing because yeah. they were witnesses to uh, many uh, those uh, terrible uh, executions. I yeah, think. absolutely. Yeah. And they were uh, they were mute, uh, just uh, silent. Yeah, there are no words to describe such a thing. Uh, um, I, I saw. Uh, Lot, okay, let's look. Uh, let's just get back to the story a little bit, though, okay, because okay. we have we don't have too long. Definitely Some people <laughs> have other things to do. <laughs> okay, so let's move on a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, I grabbed another image from the the movie. Uh, we meet Wild Bob. <laughs> ah, oh, hello, Melinda. Uh, just, uh, okay, I'm gonna just mute that for now. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I did read something about the possibility that, um, that that Wild Bob is an actual person that Kurt Vonnegut knew. Um, I need to explore. I didn't have time to really look into it. Um, but we meet my, Wild Bob. <laughs> I said Mild Bob. That's the opposite. Not mild, wild. Uh, <clears throat> um, wild Bob asks, Billy, are you one of my boys? And uh, Billy uh, doesn't really know what to say to him. <laughs> um, he says, uh, you know, one of the 154th, I think it was, or 51st, 51st. And Billy's like, the 151st what? <laughs> Infantry, oh. There's another long silence, Colonel, uh, with the Colonel dying and dying, drowning where he stood. And then he cried out wetly, it's me, boys, it's Wild Bob. That's what he'd always wanted his troops to call him, Wild Bob. Okay. Uh, why do you think I put this in here? I mean, Wild Bob, he is uh, a colonel. He's made it to the high ranks. But he's kind of like Roland. <laughs> uh, he wants his troops to call him Wild Bob. And he's living in kind of a delusional state at this point because his entire regiment is gone except for Roland actually Roland is one of his um, it says at some point uh, so poor wild Bob says if you're ever in Iowa Idaho I can't remember ask for wild Bob that's going to come up again later um so none of the people who could hear him, okay, yeah, more about Wild Bob, were from his regiment except for Roland, and Roland wasn't listening. His feet were hurting too much. The colonel imagined he was addressing his beloved troops for the last time, and he told them they had nothing to be ashamed of. There were dead Germans all over the battlefield who wished to God they had never heard of the 451st. He said that after the war, he was going to have a regimental reunion in his hometown in Wyoming. That's what it was. He said all this while staring into Billy's eyes. He made the inside of poor Billy's skull echo with balderdash. Balderdash is nonsense. Um, it's, a, it's a synonym for like bullshit. <laughs> balderdash. God be with you, boys, he said. And that echoed and echoed. And then he said, if you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, ask for Wild Bob. Um, this becomes a refrain later on for, for Kurt. Um, all right. Any, anybody have something to say there about Mr. Wild Bob? All right. Uh, Can I ask you something? Yes. Um, I want to ask, uh, and the Wild Bob is a real person, and they're... Uh, um... There apparently is some evidence that he may have been a real person that... Kurt Vonnegut knew. And that's why we get this next line. And that's why I picked this next line. Suddenly, uh, Kurt steps back into the story and says, I was there. So was my old war buddy, Bernard V. O'Hare. So he may have been. Um, I didn't have a chance to read the entirety of what I found on that. Uh, and that he didn't necessarily serve under the colonel, but he at least uh, probably knew him or was in the same uh, area, like posted to the same area as this guy. So yeah, he may have been a, a real guy. 
Um, while they're in transit on the train, most of the privates on Billy, Billy's car were very young at the end of childhood, but crammed into the corner was a former hobo who was 40 years old. Okay. <laughs> um, if you guys don't know what a hobo is, a hobo is a, a tramp. Okay, tramp. <laughs> tramp doesn't mean what you might. Okay. The old meaning of tramp is just like uh, someone who wanders, someone who travels, uh, who doesn't, basically someone who's homeless. Um, and there were a lot of hobos after World War II. Uh, you may have seen fictional, uh, like for example, the, the television show Mad Men uh, has a bit about hobo culture in it where the main character's father was a hobo. Some people came back from the war and couldn't ad adapt as many people who come back from wars are unable to adapt to civilian life if they've seen terrible things and they end up living. And this is the thing that I just thought of earlier that suddenly occurred to me, living on the rails <laughs> because hobos often would live in train cars and around train stations, they would create camp, like hobo camps. Um, how in the hell is there a hobo on the train? Uh, it doesn't say, Okay, it says a former hobo. So is he a soldier who joined the army at 40? It's like, there's so much that doesn't really work with it. So what do you guys think about this hobo? How is it, uh, how is there a hobo on the train? By the way, just to finish this part, I've been hungrier than this, he says. I've been in worse places than this. This ain't so bad. <clears throat> Why is he there? What do we think? Is he there? <laughs> Is perhaps a better question. Y yes, Yovana? He might be some figment of Billy's imagination or his yeah. inner uh, voice, his consciousness, or something like that. I think so. I suspect that the hobo is a figment of his imagination mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. oh, not for sure, but uh, I mean, describing as a hobo who he does end up sleeping in the spooning position with at some point, because they have to spoon together, as they say, to keep warm. But I didn't put anything on the slides here, but at some point we get the piece of information that none of the soldiers want to sleep next to Billy because he freaks out while he's sleeping. But the hobo doesn't mind. The hobo is totally cool with it. So yeah, it seems pretty likely that the hobo is just there in his head especially since the hobo is maybe even providing a bit of reassurance. Like he's a bit of coping where he says, oh, you things could be worse. <laughs> uh, just remember that things could be worse. Um, well, he doesn't say remember that, but he's always like, yeah, this ain't nothing. I just want to, to add something. Mm -hmm. Is there some connection like the hobo is some kind of imaginable uh, transit and helping uh, uh, how to say, uh, um, play but like a Cadillac or like a flying saucer to help uh, the main character sure. to reach something they uh, mm -hmm. didn't want or the, didn't uh, um, uh, find br um, um, some strain to, to read uh, this traumatic situation and to, to, to make um, uh, his uh, trauma more... <laughs> or to say uh, softer and uh, accept accept yeah. theme. Coping, are you saying as far as the writing? Yeah, there's a thing, I think it's called the uh, transitory mediator, something like that in, in uh, that's like from Joseph Campbell, <laughs> if you guys are familiar, the hero's journey. I think that's what it's called, transitory mediator. Um, he's, yeah, he's there on a trip and he's there to help Billy get through it. If that's what you mean, Nevena, then I think so. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, and uh, he continues saying such things like, ah, oh, this isn't that bad. Here's a picture of a hobo. <laughs> Just for a little <laughs> visual help. Um, hobos were all often portrayed in cartoons and stuff. If you watch the old cartoons like Looney Tunes and so forth, where you see 
the sort of scruffy character with a bindle that's the stick over the shoulder with a little pouch on the end of it a, a little rag tied up that's called a, i think it's called a bindle um that's kind of a ho hobo archetype there was a whole hobo subculture uh that included uh a secret language of symbols that they would use to mark people's houses. That was also in that show, Mad Men. All right. Yeah, why is the hobo in this story? Okay, we've already discussed that. I should have put that slide earlier. <laughs> why is he here? Well, is he here? We don't know, probably not. Um, Billy gets a momentary glimpse into the train guard's cart. Uh, I put this in here. Uh, because I thought it might have, uh, it might be worth mentioning a couple of things. It was like heaven is how Billy sees that guard's cart. There was candlelight, there were bunks with quilts and blankets heaped on them. There was a cannonball stove with a steaming coffee pot. There was a table with wine, a loaf of bread and a sausage. There were four bowls of soup. There were pictures of castles and lakes and pretty girls on the walls. Not horrible, not horrible pornographic images carried by a fat, mean guy who smelled like bacon. Uh, this was the rolling home of the railroad guards, men whose business it was to be forever guarding freight rolling from here to there. The four guards went inside and closed the door. A little while later, they came out smoking cigars, talking contentedly in the mellow, low register of the German language. One of them saw Vili's face at the ventilator and wagged his finger <laughs> in an affectionate warning. So these guards are sort of playful with the prisoners, telling him to be a good boy. By the way, this is right when uh, they mention that one of the men has died. And the guards, instead of panicking about it, they go and apparently relax for a bit. Um, so it's like heaven. That's the main reason I wanted to put this little uh, excerpt up here. Um, Billy finds he heaven in a very simple place, you know, just looking, I guess anything aside from the train cart would be heaven. The thing is though, it's like when, when he is in the sixties, he has everything and has no consciousness of that fact at all. He, he gets no satisfaction from his wealth later on when he finds himself materially you know, comfortable. Um, and who knows, you know, maybe those, those guards are probably saying, God, this is awful. <laughs> Being in this train cart all the time. <laughs> uh, relative degrees of heaven and hell going on here. <clears throat> Do you guys have something you'd like to add to that? Yes, Yovana? I just want to add that uh, this um, uh, picture of uh, um, some kind of castles and lakes and pretty girls, uh, it reminds me on this scene with the pony and this, uh, uh, how to say. Um, right. Well, and that's why I. This is yeah. uh, some kind of uh, uh, humiliation and uh, absurdity and uh, some kind of. Uh, um, I just, I want to say erotic uh, uh, this uh, this uh, disruption of uh, some and uh, on some uh, war war uh, situation and how to uh, in that uh, difficult situation soldiers can uh, right improve. But this is different from that, and that's why I mentioned. This is not Roland Weary's picture. These are just some pictures of pretty girls, yes, right? It's completely a different thing. It's not like a, a picture of some you know, like disgusting sex act happening, yes, right? Yes. Um, and I think that Kurt Vonnegut wants to uh, frequently point out to us a sort of um, a sort of uh, almost uh, a sort of immaturity or just kind of you know boys will be boys adolescent behavior about things. Um, you know, uh, in, among the soldiers. And, you know, that's, I think that's, that's true to life. Uh, soldiers, you know, putting up pictures of pinup girls on the, you know, inside of their bomber cockpit was, you know, a real thing. In fact, there were bombers named after pinup girls with pictures of pinup girls painted on the side. 
Um, so yeah, but really I, I wanted to just bring this up because of the looking into the guards, the guards room and seeing heaven. I mean, he already saw Adam and Eve in a boot. So <laughs> what that, that's where wild Bob has died and they finally drag him out of there. Um, Roland weary dies as well. Of course, we don't find out about that yet. I'm kind of skipping ahead slightly. Um, chapter three ends with Billy back in 1967, knowing that he's about to be abducted. Was there something? I'm sorry, Jovan, I think you raised your hand too. I'm sorry. To... Uh, yeah, I just, just this whole little scene reminded me, I'm not sure, are you familiar with the a story by Hans Christian Andersen? It's called Little Girl with the Matchbox or with the Matches? Uh, the Matchstick Girl. Yeah, the match yeah. girl. So yeah, yes. I, she's yeah. hungry and freezing, and she's looking out at this uh, beautiful Christmas dinner. It's warm yeah. inside. Yeah, so it's yeah, kind of yeah. Like um, there are more. There are more like that. I, I, not just the matchstick girl. I, I suddenly I'm having all these memories of you know, children with dirty faces staring into a beautiful Christmas repast. <laughs> um, I'm sure that it's been in some Charles Dickens stories. Uh, it's can't think off the top of my like Oliver Twist. I'm sure something like that happened in there. I just can't remember. <laughs> There's a scene in the plague when uh, uh, Legrand, no, Joseph Grand, is it Grand or Legrand? Jo Grand, Joseph Grand gets lost when he first gets sick. They can't find him, it's around Christmas. And then they find him staring through the window of some store, dazed in the street. So even in the, even in the plague, <laughs> we have that kind of scene. Um, uh, okay, so in chapter four, uh, Billy's back in 1967, knowing he's about to be kidnapped by a flying saucer. Nice description of the zebra striped hallway with darkness and moonlight. Um, He's guided by dread and lack of dread. Dread tells him when to stop. Lack of dread tells him when to go. Very straightforward. <laughs> uh, he goes into his daughter's room. The drawers are dumped. This is before his daughter's wedding. The closet was empty. Heaped in the middle of the floor were all the possessions she could not take on a honeymoon. Uh, I thought this scene was a little odd because I guess you don't figure these days. Maybe I'm just new fashioned. <laughs> just like the daughter is living with them until she gets married and then just literally takes everything with her except for the stuff she can't take on her honeymoon. Is that how it went back then? I've never heard of that. <laughs> um, she had a princess telephone extension all her own. So there's she has her own number in the room is what they're saying when they say a telephone extension um, with some kind of fancy like girly telephone on her windowsill. It's tiny nightlight stared at Billy and then it rang. Uh, this could very well be what so billy answers and there's a drunk on the other end billy could smell his almost smell his breath mustard gas and roses who could he be talking to <laughs> himself <laughs> uh, that was how he described himself at the beginning of the book getting drunk and calling people in the middle of the night using the operator operator uh can you connect me with so and so and then they would try to. And then later on in 1967, he gets a call and it's that call. Uh, it's him talking to himself, perhaps. It seems to be implied. I mean, he described his breath as mustard gas and roses. <clears throat> and he described trying to call people who were no longer at that number. So getting the wrong people. Um, yeah, there was a soft drink bottle on the windowsill. Its label boasted that it contained no nourishment whatsoever. Uh, you can see it exactly. It's one of those that says zero calories. <laughs> there is nothing in this. It's uh, completely harmless, as if completely harmless is an endorsement. Um, OK. Uh, Billy watches while well, he's, he's waiting for the flying saucer, which is, it's gotta be awesome. Um, <laughs> watches a war movie backwards and forwards. Uh, I didn't put everything here. So of course, you know, in the story, he sees the bombers flying backwards over Germany and the city is burning, but 
the bombers suck up these magical tubes and the magical tubes suck up the flames and the planes take the tubes into their bodies and fly backwards out. And some of the planes come out back out of the ground and fly back with them. Um, and eventually they all wind up back uh, at the base. And then before, af before that, well, after that, they're at home. But the part that he extends it out to, uh, the American flyers turned in their uniforms, became high school kids. Uh, and Hitler turned into a baby, <laughs> Billy Pilgrim supposed. That wasn't in the movie. Billy was extrapolating. So that's when you project out from a limited set of uh, data. Everybody turned into a baby. And all humanity, without exception, conspired biologically to produce two perfect people named Adam and Eve, he supposed. Um, so it's very comforting for him to run things backwards. <clears throat> Any comments here? Yes, Giovanna? Uh, I love the, uh, the fact that he also mentioned how the scientists, so that was the final step. Yes, <laughs> yes, so yes. The minerals and they hid it. They um, hid the minerals. Yeah, the, bomb, the bombs are disassembled and sent to various locations where scientists separate the minerals and bury them in the earth, never to hurt anyone again. Yeah, yeah, that was nice. Um, so... Trafalmadorians, he meets them. They communicate telepathically, so in order to communicate with him, they have some kind of uh, Siri voice <laughs> that speaks through a loudspeaker. Uh, it's funny because I think the first thing they say to him is, any questions? <laughs> They're like, welcome, Billy Pilgrim. Any questions? Um, he licks his lips, thinks a while, and asks, why me? That's a very earthling question to ask, Mr. Pilgrim. Why you? Why us, for that matter? Why anything? <laughs> because this moment simply is. Okay, so it's, a, it's hard to imagine seeing the world from outside of time. It's the you know, legendary view from nowhere, uh, from no perspective in particular. Uh, because how, what would, there wouldn't be a such thing as a, a place to see from, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's hard to imagine what it's like. Have you ever seen bugs trapped in amber? Yes, Billy, in fact, had a paperweight in his office. It was a blob of polished amber. Uh, amber is tree resin that's been sitting for so long that it's a stone, pretty much, with three ladybugs embedded in it. Well, here we are, Mr. Pilgrim, trapped in the amber of this moment. There is no why. So the entire concept of cause and effect doesn't exist for Trophimidorians. Um, and this, you know, this, I think, how do you think that relates to Billy's attitudes? I mean, think about it. Uh, we were just talking about how he doesn't seem to be phased by anything in his life. He doesn't display any... Uh, in his, it, it, there's also a difference between his, his later life and his earlier life. Um, when in the war, it seems he's more affected by that, by that meek uh, faith in a forgiving Jesus. Whereas in his later life, he's just numb. Um, so, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm getting at. Like, if you can kind of, it's, it's really, a, it would be a great cope to say, well, I'm not responsible for anything at all, in fact. And uh, not to open up a huge can of worms right now. We might talk about it later because uh, we'll, after we're done with the sessions that are for specific chapters, we'll probably have an extra session at the end just for, you know, Mopping up, <laughs> as they said at some point in the, in, in the story that the Germans were doing uh, for, you know, any side discussions and a little more talking. But the topic of free will is uh, in, for example, neuroscience is accepted as not to exist uh, at all. <laughs> it's a kind of an elaborate illusion that we experience. Um, 
So, you know, Billy could have just been born at a different time to be told that, no, you just don't have free will. <laughs> you didn't have to go through all this with the spaceships and aliens. <laughs> um, the meaning of no free will for the topic of things like ethics is a complicated topic that we won't get into now because I don't think there's really any solution we could come to even if we had more time. Um, there's a lot of writing on that topic if you're interested. Okay. Um, he finds himself then back on the train car. Uh, yeah, on the eighth day, the 40-year-old hobo said, this ain't bad. I can be comfortable anywhere. You can, said Billy. On the ninth day, the hobo died. So it goes. His last words were, you think this is bad? <laughs> this ain't bad. I like to imagine that he said that while he was dying. And he was, he was talking about dying. <laughs> this ain't bad. It's okay. Not a big deal. <laughs> I've been through much worse. <laughs> In fact, I'm dead already. Um, I thought that was pretty funny. <clears throat> I'm trying to think. That, that reminds me of something. I think that there was a comic relief character in some book or movie that was doing exactly this thing. Like, oh, this ain't this is. I think it was Monty Python actually. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Monty Python. It's not to everyone's taste. Um, Especially I found a lot of young people these days are like, what the hell is this? <laughs> if I've tried to show them, hey, have you checked out Monty Python before? They're like, what is this? This is ridiculous. How did people watch this and think it was funny? Um, it's silly, okay? It's not supposed to make sense or anything. Um, yeah, there's a character. I know now there's a character in the life of Brian who's tied up to a wall and he's always like oh he's like oh you think you've got it bad i think he's like uh the roman spat in his face like oh you've been spat in the face you think uh, if only someone would spit in my face like he's he, he's like uh now see it's not quite the same thing then uh never mind it'll come to me i'm i'm really kind of just riffing right now i should get back on track <laughs> but I, I know i've seen this kind of character in more than one place uh, we hear of Weary's death. Weary's in another train car. Uh, he's in delirium and agony from his clogs that have caused him to have an infection, gangrene, in his feet. Um, as he's dying, he wants everyone to know, actually he tells them constantly, that he wants to be avenged. Mm. So he says again and again in the name of the person who killed him. Everyone in the car learned the lesson well. Who killed me? Everybody would answer, Billy Pilgrim. <laughs> so he got them all trained <laughs> to know Billy Pilgrim is the guy. Um, this will be important. <laughs> yeah, why does Weary blame Billy for his death? I don't know. I guess it seems fairly obvious, but I figured I'd pose the question because we might get a little extra out of it. Um, it's... Sorry? No, nothing. It's just an outsider. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to say, why does Weary blame Billy for his death? Why is it Billy's fault? Because Billy went to college. That's why. <laughs> I mean, okay, that's one thing. Yeah. But like, that, that is, it's like, you shouldn't even be here. You don't even have a weapon. Uh, he's always treated with contempt. And really, of course, you know, really, uh, Weary does die, literally, but he are, Billy had already killed his fantasy about being one of the three musketeers, um, which is perhaps the greater sin for Weary, because at least when Weary is dying with a bunch of war veterans in a train car. He can perhaps kind of romanticize that, even though it's an ignominious death, um, considering the clogs and all. <laughs> that can't be too pride-inducing. Um, but yeah, okay, so I, I, I guess it's pretty obvious. Uh, 
for ruining the ruining the whole teleplay in his head and uh i don't know like the thing is if you think about it it's not really true because if he had just let if he had left billy and gone on with the scouts he would be dead also in fact arguably in much less painful circumstances um but, you know, Weary just has a certain way of looking at things. We hear about Edgar Derby. I don't know if you guys remember the name. If you've read the book already, then you know what I'm getting at. But it's kind of, it's not just kind of, it's relevant to what will happen later. Or maybe you recognize him uh, from earlier. Uh, one of the healthiest soldiers, basically one of the best bodies belong to uh, Edgar Derby, the oldest one there, high school teacher. Uh, <clears throat> he was in Roland's car, cradled Roland's head while he died. So it goes. Derby was 44. Does 44 keep coming up or is it just me? That's also the age that Billy is in 1967, I think. Um, I'll have to check into that more. Uh, he was so old, he had a son who was a Marine in the Pacific Theater of War. Okay. Kind of like Billy when he's in 1967. Has a son in Vietnam. Derby, so maybe he's kind of the mirror opposite opposite world of billy <laughs> he had pulled political wires to get into the army at 44 the subject he taught was contemporary problems in western civilization uh he coached the tennis team and took good care of his body derby's son would survive the war derby didn't so more irony there um I don't know, I'm thinking maybe it's not that ironic. He did join the war at 44. Um, a lot of younger people didn't make it through. I don't know. Uh, that good body of his would be filled with holes by a firing squad in Dresden in 68 days. So yeah. Uh, this is, of course, the guy who was mentioned towards the beginning who was executed for stealing a teapot out of the ruins of the city. Uh, we also meet uh, Paul Lazaro. Is it Paul? Yeah, Paul. He's the worst American body. He's a, just a, as you'll come to see as we learn more about Paul later on, just kind of a generally dislikable character, <laughs> obsessed with revenge. Um, in fact, revenge for him is the sweetest thing in life. Um, He's also just physically, so I guess we're, we're to be signaled by his physical appearance that he's not the best person. Uh, not that you should really, of course, judge people in real life that way. Uh, it's, you know, as, as a literary device, we can see his sickness on the outside. Um, yeah, he was, a, right away we learn he's a car thief. Uh, Tiny, not only were his bones and teeth rotten, but his skin was disgusting. He was polka dotted all over with dime sized scars. He had uh, many plagues of boils. So he's gross. <laughs> uh, he had also been in Weary's boxcar and given his word of honor that he would find some way to make Billy Pilgrim pay for Weary's death. He was looking around now, wondering which naked human being was Billy. Um, Okay, we'll move on from that for now. As they get into the detention center, they're given the coats of the dead. Um, they're prepared for delousing. Delousing is getting rid of lice. So uh, there's a contrast or a connection, a comparison to be made, uh, that he is told to take off his clothes. That's the first thing they tell him to do on Trafalfamador too. So there's a bit of paralleling between uh, his prisons, because regardless of the uh, relative luxury of his zoo prison on Trafalfamador, which we haven't gotten to yet, it's still a prison. Um, Billy jumps in time again, uh, back to his infancy. Uh, he was a baby who had just been bathed by his mother. Now his mother wrapped him in a towel, carried him into a rosy room filled with sunshine. She unwrapped him 
laid him on the tickling towel, powdered him between his legs, joked with him, patted his little jelly belly. Her palm on his little jelly belly made potching sounds. Billy gurgled and cooed. Uh, that's also, so those are sounds that babies make. The German uh, guards are described as cooing to get these guys to come out of the train too, which is kind of funny. I didn't really put it up here. You picture the German guards peeking in and being like, goo, goo, <laughs> to get them to come out of the train cars. Um, like they're babies. Now that, if you think about Mary from the beginning of the story, she says they were just babies. And the German guards coo to make them come out in a fluid stream, something like that. Describes them as liquid pouring out of the train, except for the colonel who has become stone. He jumps then one more time briefly. Uh, I wasn't sure what to make of this, so I put it because it's very short, uh, but I think there is a good reason to put this little quote up, uh, this little excerpt. Uh, there's a moment where he's on the golf course suddenly back in 1967. And the reason I put this up is, uh, you know, earlier I said that, you know, during the war, he'd be more affected by that meek faith of his. Well, here it says that uh, he never went to church anymore. Uh, he's playing hack hackers golf. In other words, they're taking lots of rough shots at the golf balls. They're not very good in other words. He was hacking with three other optometrists. Uh, he was on the green in seven strokes and it was his turn to putt. So it's his uh, later in life, just carelessness about anything. Um, it's doubtful he was really enjoying playing golf or anything else for that matter. Right? Okay. Coming close to the end here. Uh, back to the, uh, oops, just a sec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, he, uh, this before returning kind of threw me off. Oops, hang on a sec. Yeah, okay, another brief jump before he returns to the flying saucer. Then he asks the trough of a Tralpamidorians, how did I get here? And this is that explanation part. It would take another earthling to explain it to you. Earthlings are great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, uh, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. I am Tralfamidorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It doesn't change. It doesn't lend itself to warnings or explanations. It simply is. Take it moment by moment. So this kind of stuff just throws me off because how can you take it by moment by moment <laughs> um, if they're, if it's just, I don't know. I guess he's saying in your limited scope of vision, that's what you have to do. Uh, and you will find that we are all, as I've said before, bugs in amber. Billy replies saying, you sound like you don't believe in free will. They reply, if I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. I visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe and I've studied reports on 100 more. Only on earth is there any talk of free will. Hmm. Does that mean every other species out there is uh, also living outside of time? Who knows? Um, we might get more into the topic of free will in general, but I don't want to derail too much because that can get into a much longer discussion. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly open to having some conversations about that. Um, maybe he just learned that there was no free will and all of the trough Midorians and things are there to cope with that fact. Okay, I'm just riffing. Um, yes, Nicola. Uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, on our mop-up session, the seventh yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, because I would also like to say a few words, but uh, we would derail, and now is not the time. So, oh, yeah, definitely not now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's very interesting, and there are a few points. I mean, sure. I would like to share, and and I would like to hear from other people. So, 
from you and everyone else. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that will be, we, we did a mop up session for the previous group too. Um, cool. So cool. I, I think we'll continue doing that. Nice. So yes, Trough Midorians, free will is just a nonsense idea to them. I mean, a quick uh, aside, even outside of neuroscience, there were there have already been a number of philosophers who didn't believe in free will. Uh, Spinoza didn't even believe that God had free will, that God was just kind of like a machine. It was kind of a deistic picture of the universe. Everything is kind of a wind up, wind up toy. Okay, that sounds pretty dismissive of the universe, but <laughs> um, and others. Uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes. Well, okay. I mean, he believed that people had free will, but he was like the, the idea of an individual having free will inside of the Leviathan is nonsense. It just doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Your man is just his function in society and that's it. Um, so there are lots of ways you can parse the idea of there not being free will. Okay. Anyway. Um, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's it for now. That's the end of chapter four. We finally met our alien friends. And uh, yeah, we can, I, I would say, keep your eyes open for other evidence that it might all be just a big coping mechanism. Like the fact that he comes to 1967 and finds himself asleep during an examination of a patient. Um, I don't, of course, think that it's a question that can be definitively answered, nor should it be. Um, all right, any closing comments or questions? Yeah? I have a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, like the details about uh, uh, Adam and Eva and uh, return to status of a baby. In two mm -hmm. chapter, we have a, a return from the movie, the war movie, and uh, return uh, uh, on the state, state uh, status of the main character. But mm -hmm. it's some kind, uh, and also connection with these bugs in amber, in bubbles of amber, and some kind of uh, um, pre-existing -exist condition, like when something is going in some um, first level of uh, existence. Uh, and yeah. maybe it's the uh, tendency of the main character um, with the dead flying saucer to some kind of uh, reconnection with the past and all oh, this status of Adam Eva and uh, bags in Ember and uh, uh, return to baby status is some kind of connection with uh, like uh, Billy uh, also returns uh, with the dead flying saucer in some uh, status of um, how to say uh, um, Innocence, little uh, embryo. <laughs> to, oh, to, an embryo. To 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 to, uh, to make uh, to make uh, himself in some uh, zero position and to go to the yeah. tra trauma uh, till the uh, uh, beginning and uh, to to recreate yeah. uh, in, uh, his uh, conscious and imagination and and uh, to uh, takes the some kind of uh, reopening of trauma. Yeah, you're right. The, uh, the amber could also be seen as kind of, like you said, yeah, a little embryo, like a womb. Um, the irony being that the bugs trapped in the amber or the people, for that matter, uh, are at the end, not the beginning. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, it's a, a second womb, sort of. <laughs> the amber amber by the way is also another it's a shade of red um we could make something out of that perhaps because he does describe that beginning of life as red when we made that connection to the visible spectrum of light and then after life was ultraviolet right um so yeah no that's a good point nevena anybody else have some closing comments Yes, Jovana? Yeah, well, while we're talking about colors, so I noticed that the color of, uh, so why, why he is kind of flying up 
into this saucer or saucer. So the color is purple. Yes. Yeah. It's Inside of the saucer. Yeah. 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 I noticed that too. The light coming from the uh, windows, I think it said, of the saucer is purple. And the light around it, it says, I'm trying to remember the exact words now, something like it was decorated something like a Christmas tree or something like that. Um, but purple, yeah, it is mentioned that that it's purple or violet. Yeah, yeah. Af afterlife colors, apparently. Now, I'm going to put more effort into connecting these numbers now because I didn't really think about the 44 thing before either. Uh, it looks like <clears throat> Edgar, 44, is, like I said, sort of a mirror image of Billy in 1967. Um, we'll look for more connections there. Okay, well, in that case, uh, you guys have your assignment for next time. I think these are shorter chapters. I can't remember if these are the shorter ones. Um, but uh, also I'll remind you, please, if you would like to uh, take some portion of the text that I might have missed that you feel like you'd like to discuss, you can let me know um, by contacting me through my email. And uh, I can put a, a slide up for you. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, until next time, try to keep yourself stuck in time. Thank you for the session and the lesson. Thank you. It's not a lesson. We're just here to talk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not here to preach. <laughs> Thank you for the conversation and insight. So, yeah. Thank you. It's fun. I like doing this. It's, they're telling me this is work. I think it's, this, I'd just do this all day if I could. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I agree that the best work uh, is the one that is uh, fun, that is uh, when oh, yeah. you're playing. So, yeah. When you even feel like a child that's playing. Yeah, it's nothing like that work that's not fun. I don't like that that kind. Yeah. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Okay, guys. We'll see you next time. See you. And have a good week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. -bye. You. Bye. Thank see you. you.